It's been called the biggest miscarriage of justice in British history. Certainly, it's the biggest in scope. More than 900 sub-postmasters and postmistresses were prosecuted for false accounting and theft. Some went to prison, many were financially ruined, marriages broke down, health suffered, four took their own lives. And yet none of it was their fault. It was the fault of accounting software called Horizon, created by Fujitsu and rolled out by the post office. After multiple investigations, they have grudgingly admitted that the software makes 12,000 errors a day. At the time, the post office insisted that there were no systemic issues. It must have been the fault of hundreds of sub-postmasters and postmistresses, all with their hand in the till. And so the post office mercilessly prosecuted their own employees at a rate of one per week for year after year after year. Why are people talking about it again? because of the ITV drama Mr. Bates versus the Post Office, which has shone a light on the issue, causing a million-strong petition to be written, the former CEO of the Post Office, Paula Vanells, to return her CBE, and enormous pressure put on the government to expedite the overturning of hundreds of convictions and to pay compensation to the thousands of victims. What do we learn? Ten things in no particular order. Number one, the problem is not errors. The problem is insisting there are no errors. Every IT system has glitches. It has lots of them. The real problem is claiming infallibility. But the post office was so committed to self-justification, it prosecuted its innocent people rather than question its faulty machines. In 2014, the post office clapped back at an inquiry's criticism of Horizon, saying there is absolutely no evidence of any systemic issues with the computer system, which is used by over 78,000 people across our 11,500 branches, and which successfully processes over 6 million transactions every day. But in fact, the system made on average 32 errors a day. It's really not a good idea to declare something infallible that makes a fault every 43 minutes. Yet they doubled down, insisting they were right. And this is the heart of the human condition, according to the Bible. It's not just that we are wrong. The deeper problem is that we pretend to be right. Our problem is less our badness. Our problem is our pretended goodness. If it were just our badness, we could bring it into the open. But to use an Old Testament image, the fig leaves we sew together, or to use a New Testament image, the whitewash we apply to our deadly sin, that causes even more of a problem. Point number two. Technology can lift people up, but it also leaves people behind. It's possible to tell a positive tech story about the post office. You know, this institution has existed since 1660, and yet before 1999, you had to do all your accounts with paper and pen. Step forward Fujitsu and technology and efficiency and the future. But sub postmistresses and masters like Joe Hamilton did just fine before Horizon. Never had a problem. Then, in a powerful early scene of the drama, we see her sitting baffled in front of a screen, calling a useless helpline, and being told no one else has this problem. It's just her. But it's not just her. And it's not just Horizon. This scene is all of us. None of us know very much about the technology that has become essential to our lives. Our world is now irreversibly complex. Not just complicated, complex with systems relying on other systems and very few people possess the competence to deal with even one of these systems, let alone the interlocking networks we all depend on every day. And with AI, those in charge of the technology are saying that not even they know the ins and outs of where this technology is going. Technology can absolutely lift people up. It also leaves people behind. And worse than that, Point three, technology oppresses as well as liberates. 80 years ago, C.S. Lewis wrote about the promises and perils of technology in his book, The Abolition of Man. He said, what we call man's power over nature turns out to be a power exercised by some men over other men with nature as its instrument. Horizon promised to be a tool of liberation, freeing people from drudgery and inefficiency. In practice, it was used as a tool of oppression, freezing out the little people and empowering the organizational machine. That's point number four. Institutions protect themselves. That's what they do. Self-preservation, self-justification, and institutional blindness are baked into institutions. The question for your organization is not if you are blind to harms you are perpetrating, but in what way are you blind to harms you are perpetrating? Fergus Butler Galley has written about the post office scandal in connection with institutional problems in the Church of England. And he says, the very worst thing of all 
is that these effects rarely proceed from actual malice, but rather from blind devotion to hierarchical managerialism. They will protect their interests, and the little people will be ground in the gears. In 2019, the judge who ruled in favor of 555 claimants against the post office called it institutional obstinacy that amounts to the 21st century equivalent of maintaining that the earth is flat. Institutions tend towards the mentality of the flat earth society, and they keep perspective out. Which is why, point number five, investigations must be truly independent. The post office had an investigator. It was called Second Sight. The only problem was they were also on the payroll of the post office, and they struggled mightily to make known the truth. Sometimes you can be trusted to mark your own homework, sometimes. But when you've formed the equivalent of the Flat Earth Society, you absolutely cannot. Truth number six. Victims and whistleblowers will have complex stories. Those who were blowing the whistle on the post office tended also to be those under the cloud of false accounting allegations. They might well have had false accounting convictions. Sometimes they had theft convictions. Some of them had done jail time. A great number of them felt enormous embarrassment at having gotten themselves into these situations. They had hidden their own debts and hidden the fact that they'd had to remortgage their houses. They'd often felt really stupid and profoundly ashamed. No wonder it's taking time for more and more of them to come forward and tell their stories. Coming forwards takes time and courage, and often it takes others to go first. So then put yourself in the shoes of the people first hearing these complex stories. If you are listening to a victim, if you are listening to a whistleblower, you will have to consider, do I believe this convicted criminal who cannot meet my eye for the shame of it all? Or do I believe the huge trusted institution with its professional lawyers and executives and millions of pounds? The lessons here for church abuse scandals should be obvious. Victims and whistleblowers will have complex stories. And they will be processing feelings of profound shame. And it will not be straightforward. And that's just the individuals. The complexities multiply among survivor communities. Point number seven, survivor communities are difficult to manage. It's only touched on briefly in the ITV drama, but as Mr. Bates convenes the Justice for Subpostmasters Alliance, he brings together people who have played different roles in the scandal. In episode two, we meet Michael Rudkin who had been part of the National Federation of Subpostmasters, which the post office used to manage and sometimes silence whistleblowers. This is Michael Rudkin, friends, an executive officer of the National Federation for Subpostmasters. Not anymore. The Federation, you know, the Federation sent me back my membership fee, said he wouldn't represent me. They told me to get a good criminal lawyer, and that was the last I heard of them. Our so-called union has been in bed with the post office for years. Right, I can either leave by the way I came in or I can tell you my story. Up to you, pal. The ways in which harm happens in organisations means that there are different ways of being victims, different experiences of victimhood, and opportunities for such victims to have harmed or to harm each other abound. Survivor communities are really difficult to manage, but they can be so life giving as well. That's point number eight. Survivor communities can be life giving refuges. When each sub-postmaster brought a complaint to the post office, they were told that the system was flawless and they were the only one. But when they come together, it's incredibly powerful. Told us over and over, you're the only one. And that was wrong. That was a lie, actually. And from this moment forwards, none of us will be the only one ever again. Oh, it's glorious, isn't it? You want you never walk alone to kind of blast out at that point. It it puts me in mind of 1 Samuel chapter 22 about David. Now, Mr. Bates versus the post office is framed as a David versus Goliath story. And in that same biblical book about David and Goliath, we read 1 Samuel chapter 22, where David is up against an imposing organization with all the levers of power at their disposal. But verse 2 says, all those who are in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around David, and he became their commander. 
about 400 men were with him. The Justice for Subpostmasters Alliance became a community of the afflicted, gathered together. It's, it's the redemption that comes on the far side of oppression and atomization. Here is community. Here is love. Point number nine, drama is powerful. In the last couple of weeks since the ITV drama aired, there has been extraordinary public outrage and petitions and reversals and government commitments. These did not follow simply from the publishing of court reports, nor simply from journalism. This has come from millions of people inhabiting the story of the victims. I was vaguely aware of the story years ago. I first commented on it two years ago, but I, I never felt the story until I saw Monica Dolan playing Joe Hamilton on the phone to the Horizon helpline, seeing her click a button and watch her debt double before her eyes. It was about the most horrifying experience I've had of watching anything. I mean, I've seen The Exorcist, I've seen Saw, this was horror. Because we've all been there, infuriating IT, a faceless corporation, a baffling system, and you just get ground in the gears. We've, we've been there. But the drama put us into Joe Hamilton's shoes in a way that almost nothing else can. The star of Mr. Bates vs. the Post Office, Toby Jones, has said, In most of the political upheavals in history, not least ancient Greece and revolutionary Russia, drama has been at the center of political change. People have used it to humanize, dramatize, and bring forth change. What changes us is not simply information. We are story-driven creatures who inhabit one little drama most of the time, the one in which we are the hero and others are bit players. We need to be lifted out of ourselves, out of our ego and our biases. We need to be made to inhabit a new imaginative world, to look again, to feel again and perhaps even to enact it, to dramatize it. We need stories. And what story is it that so resonates? Truth number 10, the Christian story is supreme. In dramatizing the post office scandal, many choices had to be made. Multiple figures in real life are consolidated into one character. Now, many more figures and storylines are simply left out. You have to, if you're going to tell a single compelling narrative. A central hero has to be chosen. In this instance, it's the unflappable, indefatigable Mr. Bates. You don't give up, do you, you awkward son? Well, <laughs> someone's got to be. It's the story of the one versus a system arrayed against him, but his insistence on the truth will set the many free. Yes, compensation. Yes, <laughs> justice. But without the truth, we can't do either of those. It's a classic David and Goliath story in which the giant runs rampant to crush the little people with no hope for justice or salvation. While we're just skint little people. The evil empire is even headed up by a priest, the Reverend Paul of Anels, the then CEO of the post office. She's a non-stipendiary minister in the Church of England. She's the perfect archetype for a villain in such stories. Jesus, the son of David, the true fulfillment of the David story, he was crushed by the priests of his day. But though the truth seemed to leave him dead and buried, the truth was vindicated. Evil was vanquished and the captives were set free. As one author and tech entrepreneur, Antonio Garcia Martinez has said, the Western mind is like a tuning fork calibrated to one frequency, the Christ story. Hit it with the right Christ figure and it will just hum deafeningly in resonance. The Christian story is supreme. That doesn't mean that Christians are supreme. Perhaps the preeminent villain of the ITV drama is a Christian. And it doesn't mean that the church gets it right. As I say, there are so many lessons the church must learn for our own horrific scandals. But the story is supreme. There is a story we can return to to give us hope, a, a true story in which the great David Jesus Christ has felled the terrifying giant through suffering, oppression, misunderstanding, and appalling miscarriages of justice. The truth looked dead and buried, but the truth was vindicated. He rose on the third day to bring redemption, not to those who pretend to be righteous, but for those who know that they're sinners. Not for those who cling to their fig leaves, but for those who drop the act in the presence of love. And in this community of the broken, there is consolation, there is freedom, there is hope. 
We are ordinarily the little people at the mercy of the giant. But there is a giant killer. He really does have the last word. The systems and powers and faceless machines of this world will be brought to nothing and the meek shall inherit the earth. That's the story that resonates. That's the story of stories. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want to find out more, please do our course, 321. It's completely free. It's deep. It's rich. It's moving. And you can do it now. Sign up at 321course.com. Start an account. It's free. We won't spam you. There are no hidden costs, no in-app purchases. Make an account. Click begin and discover the story of stories. Please like this video, share it, and click subscribe so we can talk again on the next one. I'll see you then.